the questions on everyone's mind is where can I invest my money for the greatest returns? And I truly believe that this decade that we're in is going to be the decade for commodities. The bull market, it's just getting started. And in today's video, I'm going to show you why I think that. Welcome back, everybody. I'm going to start this show off by showing you a tweet. It's from January 18th by Chamath Paliapatia. If you don't know who that is, that is a, a venture capitalist. And he has a gigantic audience, a gigantic following. You can see him on CNBC. He's kind of uh, quite big in the media, especially as of lately. His tweet was very interesting and not because he's calling out stuff that I've been actually looking at myself. That's not why I find it interesting. But what I find interesting is that people with large audiences now are starting to talk about the same things. And that is a very, very good sign if you're early into these stages. And so what did he talk about? Well, he says that these are some of the areas of climate change investing that he's going to be following closely. And right at the top of the list, materials and mining. Okay, He said getting the raw inputs we need for battery and electric motor manufacturing. Then he talks about batteries, building new cathode materials, materials keyword, and batteries themselves. Electrification, using electric alternatives for transport. Another key thing to be paying attention to. All right. So I, I could keep going down the list, but you know, grid level storage, resiliency, project finance, lending, et cetera, et cetera. But what I want to call out here that's at the top of the list is very important around commodities. Okay. It's not just the commodities themselves. It has to be the producers of the commodities as well. So we're going to be talking about that in this video. And I'm going to be showing you why that is so important in this video using things like relative strength and i'll be mapping out key levels okay this goes beyond just gold and silver which is still very very important because materials mining raw inputs you know it, it could be vast especially when it comes to electric motor manufacturing let's go ahead and just hop right into today's show first off i want to just point out what have commodities been doing well let's look at lumber bam through the roof wheat through the roof soybeans Oof, through the roof. This is rare strategic metals ETF through the freaking roof. Completely vertical. Uh, light crude oil been on the move. Um, this is the DBA. This is an agricultural fund through the roof. It's been flying up higher. This is the CRB index completely moving higher. This is a basket of commodities being traded. Even Bitcoin is doing exceptionally well. And some people might not say this is a commodity, but I mean, a commodity is technically an asset. And if you believe Bitcoin to be an asset, I mean, this would technically fall into the commodity section. All right. So this is interesting because, well, even the stock market, the equity market's going up. So what is what do they all have in common here? And this is the very important theme of today's video. They're all going up and the dollar has been falling down. So as the dollar continues to get weaker, that's really good for commodities. Heck, it's even been good for equities this far. And I can show you a closer correlation by showing you this CRB up top and the US dollar right down below. So you can see the CRB right here. It is actually in a period of this downtrend putting in lower highs. So that is a lower, you know, it's, it's trending down since 2009 with some peaks and troughs or trials along the way. And we're running into an area of resistance. But when you look at the dollar, well, what's the dollar been doing? The dollar has been putting in higher lows up until recently. Okay, this is the monthly time frame. We broke down through this trend and we have yet to see the CRB index break above. Now, what I want to call out here that's important is we had a falling wedge. It's the technical pattern. And then we broke out to the upside. And now we have another falling wedge forming. So we might be still potentially breaking out to the upside of this as well. Now, we would run into resistance at some point. And if you ever heard of Brent Johnson, he has um, a theory known as the dollar milkshake theory. He believes that we'll be seeing a big massive flood into dollars, which could put a lot of pressure on commodities and various other assets, mining companies, everything that Chamath Paliapatia mentioned, it could put a lot of pressure on. However, Brent Johnson's long-term view even past that state is that the dollar will continue to deteriorate due to many other aspects. And you could Google his, you know, what, what, what he talks about there. You can also look at uh, Google Lynn Alden and she talks about the, the case for the falling dollar as well. 
So if the dollar continues to fall, you might be thinking, well, why not just be in U.S. equities? Well, that's a very important thing because U.S. equities have been rising up really high, right? Everything's going good. But I want to also show you this. This is the Brazilian stock index. This has also been going really good because they're closely correlated. But where am I going with this? Okay, you might be asking, I don't, I don't understand where you're going with this. So I got to show you comparisons here. All right, so I'm going to show you four charts. And this is very important because we're talking about the decade for commodities. So we're dating back to early 2000 to up to the financial crisis. All right. And what I want to show you here is the dollar at the very bottom of the chart. You can see the dollar from 2002, 2001 range, head lower, right? Lower highs, lower lows, all the way to about 2008, mid 2008. The dollar lost 40% of its purchasing power. How good and how well did the S&P 500 perform during that same time? Well, the S&P 500 from its um, lowest point right here, which was in 2002, 2003, right around here, to its peak right around here in 2008 was up 93%. Okay. So what you're telling me here is that the dollar lost 40% of its purchasing power. Meanwhile, you made 100% in the U.S. market. Pay close attention to that. So it looks like you're doing great. I mean, 100% you know, nowadays is really nothing, right? But then during that rise up, you're losing 40%. So you need to find what's going to give you higher percentage points to make up for a falling dollar. You need to overperform U.S. equities. When the U.S. dollar does poorly, when it continues to fall, well, foreign currencies and foreign markets tend to do well. Now, I want you to pay close attention to the CRB index right up here. That was during the time of a bull market. So we had a bull market here and we had a falling dollar here. So during a bull market in commodities and a falling dollar, the S&P 500 had a 93% gain. Brazil, on the other hand, was up 764%. Why? Why were they up 764%? Well, I'm going to tell you. The reason why Brazil was up 746% is because they benefit not only from a falling dollar, but they benefit from rising commodity price prices. Why would they benefit from rising commodity prices? Well, it's because they're a heavy exporter in commodities. It's the double whammy. So the decade for commodities, what I'm talking about in this video and pointing out in this tweet to kind of wrap everyone's framework around is, we need to start looking not just as commodities, which is also very important. We need to look at the countries and the equities in those foreign countries that are going to be producing these commodities, that are going to be mining these commodities, that might already have the infrastructure built to produce these commodities. Because as we see right here, would you rather have 93% gain on a 40% falling dollar? Or on a 40% falling dollar, would you rather have a 764% gain during a commodities bull market? It's very simple. Let's carry on. The next couple of charts I'm going to be talking about have to do with relative strength. All right, what's relative strength? Well, relative strength is a ratio. It's taking a stock or an equity, a various equity or an ETF, and dividing it into another stock and or equity or commodity or whatever the case is. All right, so just to give you an example, this is just an example. I'm not talking about this right now, but this is a very common one, the gold to silver ratio. All right, so in short, what does this mean? When it says gold over silver, we're dividing gold into silver. So when the line goes up, that means what? That means gold is doing better than silver. When the line goes down, that means silver is doing better than gold. This is a technical tool that many, many people use. And it's very important because it helps with finding asset allocation and various sector rotation strategies. So I pointed out just a couple things here of how you would use it. For example, when we really got low here, what does that tell you? Well, it tells you, I mean, do you think that you should buy silver here or do you think you should buy gold here? Well, if the chart is moving down, that means on this specific ratio, silver is performing better. So at these low levels here, you would want to convert your silver into gold. Or if you were deciding, hey, should I buy silver or gold? You would be better off buying gold because from a relative standpoint, that was the low and then gold outperformed silver. See, over here, more specifically, I actually put out a video at this very high peak. We saw the gold to silver ratio reach super high. And at that specific point in time, I was talking to the best investment opportunity is silver. 
because I knew silver was going to perform better at these overextended levels than gold. And then it went whoop, right to the downside. And most of my gains, yeah, gold went up too, but silver performed better. And now we're kind of seeing this little dead cat bounce in my head lower. This right here, this is a relative strength graph. You can find this at stockcharts.com. I don't know if it's free or not. I have their subscription and no, they're not sponsoring this video. Actually, I'll talk about my sponsor here shortly. I am being sponsored for this video and I'm very thankful for that because they allow me, you know, they support the channel and I'll tell you who it is in a moment. They support the channel, um, which, which helps me able to free up some time and do the research necessary. So this is a relative strength graph. And what we're looking at here is the tails and then the head, and it's moving into different sectors. Okay, we have improving, leading, lagging, and weakening. You can see energy. We're looking at the uh, 13 weeks, so about three months time. Okay, energy is performing well, and financials is doing good. Energy is important to call out because energy, you, you can find a lot of co commodity type um, producers within energy. And then down here, I want to just call out these two, XLB and XLI. More specifically, XLB, but just notice how they're really kind of tightly wrapping around these levels and just kind of holding still right now. A lot of my attention has been on XLB. And now, this relative rotation graph, it's, it's, it's benchmarked on the SPY, so every one of these is a sector within the S&P 500, also known as a spider, um, but that's not important at this particular point in time. So I want to put more attention to XLB. Why? Well, it's the materials. And materials, I believe, are going to be very important within the commodities bull market. If I go into the XLB, you can see various different types of industries within that sector. So we have, this is three month, of, a rolling three month here, and you can see non-ferrous metals leading the way here. Actually, the people that are sponsoring me, if you click this um, link, I don't I don't have that chart, but Kalinex Mines is the sponsor of today's video, and you can find them when you click there, and they have been just performing like a monster these last few weeks, and I'll, I'll talk more about them at the end of the episode. All right, but also take note here down here, we have gold mining, mining, commodity ke uh, chemicals, container and packaging, specialty chemicals, aluminum, paper. All right, it's a, a lot around the commodities plays. When I look at relative strength now on the XLB over the SPY, you can see that materials have been actually performing very well since April to February. It's been a chop fest, but it's been holding a solid trend up. So we're starting to see relative strength pick up in materials, and that is a good sign. Now, as of 2021, we've been heading lower, but we still haven't broke a trend lower as of yet. And there's a possibility that we do, okay? There's still the very possible, like what Brent Johnson says in the dollar milkshake theory, we can have, um, we could have a shock that could, the dollar can shoot us up higher. And, you know, that would be pretty dramatic. That, that, would, that would hurt materials. That would hurt gold. That would hurt equities. That would hurt a lot of different things. When I look at materials on a candlestick chart on the weekly time frame, it's been moving up nicely, broke, you know, recovered the February loss. I will say that it got overextended here on the RSI in this three bar pattern right here. Um, it doesn't look too good. I believe they call this an evening star. We had some confirmation to the downside. So we might go retest 68.27, let it cool off before we run up higher. And even looking at the price percent oscillator, it looks like it's crossing over. Now this is short term and I'm gonna be showing you some longer term charts to help you really see the big picture because the big picture is very important when investing in these commodities. And that's why we're talking about the, the decade, right? Bull markets, they'll try to kick you off. The bull will try to kick you off. The, the, the big saying is, you know, they climb a wall of worry. All right, so here is the commodity index, the CRB, divided into the S&P 500. So what does this mean? Relative strength, right? When it goes down, that means the S&P 500 is performing stronger than the CRB, the broad basket of commodities. And what I want to point out here is that very same area we were talking about of Brazil, when we hit that bull market, you know, Brazil was doing really good. Commodities were doing good. That was right here in this in this range. And now, once again, you know, since we broke down through that support, we're trending lower. So right now, equities are performing better than hard assets. However, a couple of things that I want to call out is what takes place when this trend breaks and goes up. Potentially, we might be seeing a very similar thing take place that we saw here. You got to understand the Fed is trying to target higher inflation. Well, higher inflation means higher commodity prices, you know, higher prices for me and you at the grocery store. 
And uh, from a technical perspective, this relative strength index right here is putting in a higher low. Now, don't confuse the RSI with this relative strength. That is completely different. This is just an indicator. This right here just got back into the positive territory. It's still a low reading, but you can see here, we were low here and we had a lower low. We were low here and have a higher low. That's a positive divergence. So it's very possible once we start breaking through this trend, that's the early stages of the bull market. And that's why I've been saying, I think this is the early stages of some to see some big gains in the commodities area. Now, let's look at another relative strength graph. This is CRB over USB, which the USB is 30 year tr US Treasury bonds. And I wanna call out this. We had a falling wedge pattern and then we broke out of it. When did we break out of it? What do you know? Right around that 2000 to 2008 range. That was the same area where Brazil performed very, very well. And now we have a very similar technical pattern here taking place. And another thing I want to call out is when this broke through, it did so when the price percent oscillator on the monthly time frame, mind you, had a bullish crossover. And what took place here just recently is a bullish crossover right at a very similar period in time or period on the technical pattern. So is this warning us and telling us that, you know, the commodity market is going to be performing significantly better than the bond market, potentially, right? That, that's what it's showing us right now, if, if it continues to break out. So we got to keep a close eye on that. And now if we look at some long-term charts of say gold and silver, I want to call out a few things here, right? We've been in this monster move in gold. These are yearly candles because a lot of people have been saying, well, you know, it's going to crash. But let me, mind, let me remind you, what was the February crash like? It's pretty crazy, right? Well, look at this yearly candle right here. You see the bottom right there? That is where gold opened. You see the low right there? That was the lowest point in 2020. That little boop move. So as aggressive as that felt, notice how little it looks when you look at the big picture. And when you look at the big picture, what do you see? You see bullish momentum to the upside. You see the price percent oscillator looking like it's going flat, but it wants to curl to get positive. So what is this little pink box here? And what are these three levels? Well, if we have some sort of spike in the dollar, it could cause gold and silver to head lower. So this little area right here is where I'd feel comfortable putting more money in to say gold, the physical asset or miners or other various commodities as well because I feel like there's going to be a lot of support in this area if the price can even get to these levels. And it's possible if we see the dollar really rip higher. And the same thing goes with silver. Look at this big, huge move in silver. Okay, this is the yearly candle. Then we took this dip. Boom. Now you can see on this, this yearly candle, it opened here and that was a much more bigger of a shock to silver. Why? Well, silver, silver is more volatile. And silver is very important going back to Chamath's tweet. He's talking about mining, raw materials, batteries. He's talking about electrification. Well, silver is very, very important for this type of stuff. And if it's important for that type of stuff for, you know, electrification, for example, and EV vehicles, that means there's always going to be a buyer for this specific commodity. And if there's always a buyer for this specific commodity and always a need for it, that is a good sign for the long-term outlook for silver. And by the way, it does more than just, you know, help electrical vehicles or to make batteries for electrical vehicles. Okay, there's more demand than that. For example, jewelry is just a simple one just to note. It's also highly conductive and it can also be used as antibacterial. So you can have stuff, the silver ions absorb oxygen and that typically kills bacteria. So you can see that being used in various things such as like water purification or dental hygiene, dental hygiene stuff. And one of the parts of his tweet, I mean, it said it right here. What did it say? It said something about water. If we're talking about water or storing water. Well, silver plays a part for that antibacterial for the storage of water. And it's been done for centuries. Chamath also mentioned about solar. And well, solar is also plays, a silver plays an important role in solar panels. So the list goes on and on for silver's usages. And you could Google it. I'm not, that's not what this video is specifically about, but what makes gold and silver such a great commodity is because it's both a precious metal and it also has industrial uses. Now, gold, and, gold for example, doesn't move nearly as fast and aggressive as silver or other various commodities. 
So if you're looking to you know, find assets that move faster, you can look into the mining and the producing of those commodities. And you can look at various stocks that kind of fall within that. Like for example, GDX, this is gold miner ETF. So this is not junior miners, this is the gold miners. You'll see that they move tremendously more powerful in short periods of time. You can see here, you know, from 16 to a high of around 44, that was a significant, you know, larger move than gold and silver because they're more volatile. So you got to understand when gold or commodities fall or the dollar rises, these get hit harder, but they also rise much faster. And then you can look at the SIL. This is where a silver miners ETF, and it's been kind of consolidating sideways here for quite some time. Now, a lot of other commodities at this specific time have been rising very rapidly. So that's why I really have a, you know, a close eye on the silver miners, gold miners, and various other producers. And then you have the junior silver miners too as well taking place that I'm keeping a close eye on. And these, these have also been kind of just consolidating sideways. Now, junior miners hold a lot more risk. You can see here from $5 to, you know, a high of around, what is it, 17. So a 300% increase in a very, very short period of time. Now, this is important to note because if we are in a decade of where commodities are going to be in another bull market, similar to what we saw on this chart here from you know 2000 to 2008 or 9, 2008 I should say. So if if we're going to see a very similar thing take place as the Fed tries to target inflation and they're just devaluing the dollar by printing more money and trying to stimulate the economy and you know the potential for universal basic income and yield curve control and all these various tools. You've got to look for what will bring you the most returns over that course of time. And looking at the U.S. equity market from the past, you know, it can go up. It can continue to rise, right? That's great. But if your dollar is falling at a very rapid rate, are you really actually making money as, yes, you see your dollar balance goes up, but your purchasing power lowers. So you need to look at relative performance and, you know, some of the I guess I can just start talking about now. Some of the countries that I am keeping a very close eye on is going to be Latin America. It's going to be Russia. It's going to be Canada. It's going to be Brazil because those are all four huge exporting countries and commodities. And if we're in a commodity bull run, I want to make sure that I want to get the best of both worlds. Um, a falling dollar would benefit greatly. And then also on top of that, a commodities bull market would benefit those countries greatly. So I'm going to be looking at individual equities within those countries to help produce long term, decade long, five year outlook, 10 year outlook of some very heavy producers. And in that, I'm going to be finding gold miners, silver miners. I'm going to be finding lithium producers, uranium producers, and I'm going to be looking at the big ones. So as the videos continue to come out on YouTube, you'll be, ta you'll be hearing me talk more about individual companies, but I wanted to really start wrapping your head around the things that, I start, that I'm seeing start to take place and unfold, okay? So we still haven't broke out of some key levels. You can see that here and you can see that here. We're still in that relative strength downtrend. However, with what's taking place currently, I have a strong reason to believe that this trend can change and it could change very fast. And as you've already seen on some of these miners, we are seeing some huge gains and now we're finally seeing it take a breath and some consolidation, which is very unlike the stock market, the US market, like the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, the uh, small cap, the Russell 2000. It has been going completely vertical and not to say it can't continue, but I want to make sure that when I enter in and when I start building up, continue to build up, I should say, my portfolio around commodities, that I'm going to be entering in at some levels that make sense to me. I want to go ahead now and thank the sponsor of this video, Kalinex Mines. Um, they've been known for exploring Canada's most prolific base in precious metals districts. They are a zinc junior miner. What comes with finding zinc, you can find other deposits such as copper, silver, and gold. Their mission, to discover and develop base and precious metal rich deposits within established Canadian mining districts and they got an award winning team their team is led by max porterfield president and ceo then we have a geologist and advisor here mike and he was inducted to the canadian mining hall of fame 
We have James Pickle. He is one of the geologists, and he was part of the um, discovery of the 777 mine, which was a huge discovery. We also have Alan down here, a geophysicist, and he also received an award for his role in the Lelor Mines discovery. I think I'm pronouncing that right, Lelor. This is Kalanek's website. The link is gonna be in the description, but in recent news, why it's so important to have a powerhouse team. In September, Kalanek discovered two high-grade copper, gold, silver, and zinc lenses in the Flin Flon Mining District. And I'll get into their projects here momentarily, but that was huge news for Kalanek. As of recent news, Kalanek also identified a highly conductive anomalies along the strike from Rainbow Discovery at Pine Bay Project in the Flin Flon uh, Mining District as well. When you get good news like that coming out from these junior miners, you typically see the share price head north. And if we bring up a chart of them, right now I'm looking at the spiders and we've been talking about the material sector. And if you go to the material sector, um, they're located actually in non-ferrous metals. And even if I do a three month look over here, you can see non-ferrous metals the past three months, we're seeing a huge increase, 66.15% up in non-ferrous metals. And if I open that up, you'll see a bunch of different companies, but guess what we see here? Well, we see Kalanex Mine. So if we go ahead and click on Kalanex Mine, I can show you the recent performance. And you can see here from the bottom of March, well, actually, first, let's talk about when they found that deposit in September. You can see a huge run up um, here uh, during that time of that announcement. And then we had the March drawdown, which affected equities across the board. And look at just how much they have moved in recent months or the year of 2020, up 1,400%. And you might be looking right now at this breakout candle of this bull flag, up 53.54% this week, based strongly around that news that just recently came out. We're seeing an uptick in the volume accumulation as well. I am gonna be keeping my eye on this chart. Also keep in mind, I'm not making recommendations here by any means. I personally do not own any shares at this particular point in time from Kalanex Mines, um, ticker symbol CLLXF, or even the one on the TSX Venture Exchange. Always note there is high risk involved when dealing with exploration mining companies. Now, Kalanex Mines has quite a few projects going on in three different districts as of now. We have the Bathurst Mining District. I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly. And you can see all the projects here. We got Nash Creek Project within that district, Super Jack, Jack Project, and the Headway Project, which is coming soon. And then we have the Flin Flon Mining District, which has a lot of history, rich history there. You have the Pine Bay Project, and then also the Flin Flon Project. After that, we have the Butchins Mining District. And once again, I think I'm pronouncing this correctly. Um, they have the Point Leamington Project. If you wanna find out about these projects, you can go to the Kalanex website and you can click each one of these projects. Let's just do one for example. And it's gonna show you all the statistics and what they're doing. It's gonna give you an overview and the resources. What's really nice to note as well is Kalanex, um, the jurisdictions that they're mining within and their projects that are in, they are miner friendly. So the government in that area and the communities, they don't really push back on these companies because they rely heavily on these companies for employment, for jobs, and for taxes. When we look at their corporate overview, their financials, I want to call out something very important here. The company has zero debt. That's very good. And another thing that I want to call out on their corporate overview is just the massive insider ownership taking place. So it's north of 30%. So that means it's very important for these small companies to have their money, you know, their ownership be heavily weighted between, you know, the management of who runs it, their friends, their families, their associates, etc. It shows that they got skin in the game. If you'd like to learn more about Kalanex Mines, I'd highly suggest you to go to their website, click on the investors tab, and you can there download their corporate presentation. You can download the PTF or the fact sheet itself. When you do download the PDF, it'll look like this, and it's gonna give you more data. 
Their presentation deck here has 38 pages and it'll allow you to really kind of dig in deep and learn about all the things that they do and it'll give you more insight into their current projects that they are currently working on. Um, you'll be able to see more up close pictures of the projects. You can see stuff like here, the Flin Flon District Overview. But not only that, it's also going to show the other projects as well, such as the Pine Bay. So if you're a data junkie like myself, you can hop into their website, download this PDF. I will have the link in the description below, and you can really dig deep into everything that Kalinex Mind does. Now, I just want to once again thank them for sponsoring this video. It really does help and uh, support my channel. It makes a big difference for me. So thank you once again. And as always, everyone have a excellent day.